All right, good morning, everybody. Today we are gonna talk about the new feature in redesign um, workflows. This is a new feature in both the USPS as employee onboarding, as well as the USAS for requisitional approval workflow. The beta, the beta testing version was actually released in August and it included districts that used it, tested it, and gave suggestions in approving it before it went live on September 24th. So we thank those districts and now we have the live version. It was released, uh, is that last Friday? September 24th. We do have the PowerPoints out there where you signed up. So here's the requisitional workflows that I'll be covering and then the employee onboarding. We will have the recording out here after the session is done. Um, and notice the other links have been populated for future meetings. So you could go ahead and start signing up. All right, so I am going to start with the USAS requisitional approval workflow. This is not new and it was, or this is new and because it was not available in classic. So there's no migrating or balancing with the implementation. However, there are some setup steps that we have documented here. Um, and this is the technical page and I'm gonna scroll. This part I'm not gonna be reviewing today, but it's available. Um, the link is provided in the PowerPoint and it was also in Mark's email that announced the, the new workflow release on September 24th. So once you go towards the bottom and I apologize for scrolling, you see the post install procedures for USAS and this is basically what I'll be covering. And then down below is the USPS for the employee onboarding. These links right here is what I'll be going over today. How to set up a requisition workflow in USAS, how to submit a requisition for approval, and how to approve requisitions as well as rejecting and recalling a requisition. And those links are actually in our appendix And it's a separate link workflow procedures. And those three topics are included and it walks you right through. So we're gonna start with setting up requisitional approvals. So after the technical steps that are done, we're gonna to go to system modules. Oh, sorry. First, we got to log in. Okay, there we go. System modules to turn on the workflow module. And you can see that it's been installed, but if this was not, you would click that and refresh the page. In order to have the email notifications emailed to you with the approvals, you got to have the email notification services enabled, the file transfer notification services enabled, and the HTTP notification services enabled. And all those are enabled for me. So the next step would be to go to system configuration to edit, and you scroll down here to the bottom, edit the workflow configuration to enter the, the full URL of the USAS application, check mark the workflow approval and click save. It will ask you to click here to refresh the page. <clears throat> Um, once you do that, that enables like the menu ob 
uh, menu items. You'll also want to configure the email, make sure that's configured and it probably already is. And then we have the requisition approval configuration. This will set the due date and the content um, of your email approvals. So you can customize the, what you're gonna put in, in these emails. Sorry, I was moving out these, the chat window out of the, out of the view. So here, um, like I said, it'll set the due dates and the content of the approval emails here. Some of it's already set up. You have options here too. You cut and um, if you click on the question mark, it comes up with some tips. But the options days after submission. If you select nothing, there will <clears throat> after the user submits the requisition for approval, which I'll show you um, later on in this meeting, there will be no due date if this is blank. Another option is the number of days after submission. This will sign, assign a due date based on the days after submission, which here is five. And then that will show on the grid, which I'll show you as red um, on the day that it's due and any day past due. The days before due date for yellow coloring, like a warning, warning it's coming due. Here in this instance, it's set for two days before. So if I submit a requisition today, October 1st, it'll be showing red next Wednesday, five days after I submitted it today for approval. And Monday, when the principal, whoever I submit it to for approval, it'll show yellow as a warning that it's coming due and that'll show yellow on Monday. And it would show yellow on Sunday, but we're not working on Sunday. All right, and then the other option would be the last day of the posting period. Here again, these options changed and now we only have two days before you get a warning. I'm gonna shut my window just a moment. All right. This is gonna, if I submit a requisition today, dated October 1st, submit it today, it's gonna not show due until October 31st. And then the, it's gonna warn the approver two days before it's due, so October 29th. And then down below, some of these, this part is coded in already. This other part down below is what I customized. So when the all approved email goes out, this is what it's gonna say, requisition, blah, 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 has been approved by all approvers. And then I customized it with my own message. And then you can have a approval bypass email that you can customize. This would be if Somebody in the approval process is absent and the treasurer wants to bypass all the people in the chain and just want to get the requisition approved. Um, this will be the notification sent in email notifying that it's been approved and bypassed all the, uh, the rest of the chain has been bypassed. Um, and then this is the, um, the first email, it's requisition one, two, three, has been submitted for approval. This one will show that it's been approved, approved by the user. And then we even have a rejected email set up. So, and I'll show you the reason will populate as we reject it. And I, I will show you that today. 
So that's the, e the requisition approval configuration. I am going to put it back to X number of days, but I do have an example of the last post, the last day posting period too. Let's see. So let's go to the requisition grid and I'll show you. Actually, I am going to show you the coloring that I was talking about. So here is the due date. So obviously they're past due and it's, it's notifying me that they're red and past due. This is the one that Doug, the secretary, submitted for approval today, but the email configuration was set to be the last posting period. So it's not gonna show due until October 29th because the due date isn't until the last day of the posting period. Um, Also on this particular one, uh, Doug entered it on 928 and had it to the last posting period. So that was my two examples, just showing that. And then the after we configured the email configurations, the PowerPoint actually had examples of my customized emails if you were interested in looking at those. And then if you're following along with that technical page or the appendix, the next step would be go to go to system and the workflow configuration. And this is to test the connection to ensure that the workflow database can communicate with the redesign. So mine's already set up and working just fine. So now here comes the fun part. Under system, we first have to set up groups and group chains under the system menu. This will set up the flow of the workflow approval process, kind of like a flow chart. Who's the next person or group that the requisition will flow to next for approval, creating that group chain. So whoever looked at or approved the paper requisition, for instance, would be a group in the computer. And a group can have, these can be shifted. A group can have one or more users, like this one has four users. Um, these groups are then assigned to a group chain, which we'll show in the next step. So here I have the assistant treasure as only one user because there's only one assistant treasure. Athletic director here, I have that um, there are two users in here. So think of like two athletic directors at two different high schools. If I view this, this is going to um, be the same as if you're setting it up. Whether I create or view, this is the screen that is going to show. So I would name my group. Um, and, and you can have, I don't know if you want to call this a function or an operation, but you have a choice between and or or. In this group, I have that either high school athletic directors, Jay or Justin, can approve. So at either high school, either one of them can approve a requisition if I, set, if I set that in the group chain. So you set your function or operation. You can, you can set your description. And it's just a tip that I found was, like if you look at the other groups, this one has high school principal or assistant. So I put it over here. Because down here, I have principal and assistant. So I put that in the description just to help out. So again, you can have a number of users. 
This particular one has four users and any of the four can approve. So in this group, Alice, Alan, Brad, or Christina, one of them has to approve if that is in the group chain. And then all that information is here with familiar icons, view, edit, and delete. You would not be able to delete a group if it's um, attached to a transaction. And I also forgot to tell you that Oh, that's the next step, sorry. Okay, so the next step is group chains. We got our groups of who we're gonna approve under system group chains. Again, the, the edit and create button are gonna give the same view. And this is the one that I was looking for it just a moment ago and I got lost in my notes. You can include in this grid any archived groups. So you see this one to be deleted is actually archived. But if I wanted to see it on the grid, I'll just check mark it. So again, if I click create, it's gonna show the same view as this. So I'm just gonna review the setup. And again, you set up the name of your group. Here I have high school science. Um, I didn't put a description in it, but you can. The type right now is um, requisition approval. Here is where you make it archived or not on the grid. I just check marking it or not. And then These are the groups that are available. These were over here originally. And I selected them from left to right in the order that I want it to be approved. So I'm building the group chain. So Doug, the secretary, submitted the requisition for approval to this high school science group chain. In this high school group chain, it first goes to the lead teacher. And there's only one user, so the operation would be and. Only one person would approve. After, and this lead teacher in the system is Christy. So after Christy approves, it then goes to this group. And this is where I was saying the tip of um, putting that in. High school principal or assistant can approve, and there's four users. So when I set this up, I was thinking an assistant principal and principal at one high school and the same at another high school. But for science class, any one of them can approve this requisition. After any one of those approves, then it goes to the treasurer and it's the final approved, and there's only one treasurer. And you notice the order is here, one, two, three. Any questions so far? All right, so we got our groups, we got our group chains. I'll show you another one just as an example. So cafeteria. Pat, the, Pat, there's a question out in chat. Can you reorder ones that has moved to the right? Just oh, that's a that. good question. Um, right now you can't. So there's even a tool tip here. Drag groups from left to, oops. Sometimes those tool tips don't work for me. Anyway, you got to reorder it. So if I had, uh, I don't know why that's not working. <laughs> I 
There we go. Sorry. It's Friday. Thank goodness. So no, right now you can't drag it. You have to just start all over. There might be a feedback issue out there, but I, I don't know for sure. Um, Pat, I think if you, I think you can drag and drop like within the list though, right? Um, I know it was kind of acting funky for you, but you may not have to like fully start over. Uh, like I would see if you can drag one right in between those, like drag in the list um, from the left to the list. Oh. Yeah. So you can do it this way. This is the same way that like those sort options work um, in the report builder. So it's just like that if, um, you know, that's something that like your users will probably be familiar with. Just not drag and drop here. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. So I am gonna put this back. And we do have another question from Heidi in the chat. Oh, thank you. And the question is what happens if you need to change and there are recs already in the process? Um, if you need to change on a requisition, I, you can recall a requisition and I will go through that process. Um, either the one of the approvers can reject a requisition or the original requisitioner, like Doug, the secretary, can recall the requisition to edit it, delete it, and then even resubmit it. Um, if you need to change the group chain, I believe, I think I have an example. I just don't know which requisition it would be. I think, Pat, I think this one came up after Oedza, and if you change the group or the group chain, I believe it's either of those, then the requisition would have, would restart in the process. So it, like, if it's like halfway through the group chain, I think that might be what Heidi means. So if oh, it's okay. like approvers, yeah, and then they go like change some, but like they change the order of the chain, then it would restart. And then I was looking for an example because it would record it here. Oh, here we go. Change group chain. Oh yeah, there you go. Exactly. Um, and I'll get to how this plays into it in just a moment too, but it does have the, like an audit trail of when it changes. Great questions. So we got our groups. And we got our group chains. And in order to assign the group chain for the user, like Doug, the secretary, to choose, um, we have to set it on the user. I'm, I'm logged in as admin. And right now, the ITC level access is who has the ability to assign the group chains on the user. So if I go to Doug, on the user. You see this section right here. So this is saying that Doug, the secretary at the junior high can submit to these group chains. So if he was putting in a requisition for athletics, he would go through the um, athletic group chain. If he was doing a requisition for food service, he would go, he would select that. So, but he can't submit um, to the cafeteria group chain or the purchasing department. Filters can be used and it, um, they can and will be used for requisition approval. So as long as the approver has read only access on the account code listing, <coughs> excuse me, 
as long as they have the read only access on the account code that's listed on the requisition, they can approve or reject that re requisition. <clears throat> so, roles. To approve a, and these are defined in the documentation as well as the PowerPoint, but to approve a requisition, you don't need any extra permissions if you have USAS rec or higher. So Doug, the secretary, probably wouldn't be approving a requisition, but he has the ability to. Sometimes there are people like the principal or the athletic director that don't um, enter requisitions, but they are part of that group chain. So they have to approve requisitions or reject. So I am gonna go to the roles. So for those users, I set up a requisitional approver. I'm gonna pull my description over here. Because in my description, I also put that this permission can change accounts. So if I open up the permission or the role, you can see these are the permissions needed to approve or reject a requisition, but also have the ability to modify the account on the requisition if needed. So this might be like the principal or the athletic director. They don't need the um, USAS REC permission, but they do need this permission to approve or reject. You also have, you might have a situation where you want them to approve requisitions, but you don't want them to update account numbers on the REC. This might be like Christy, the lead science teacher. You want her to approve, but you don't want her to change that count number on the requisition that the secretary submitted. So in that instance, I set up another role, REC approver only cannot update accounts. And I had to shorten this, this was a tip because later when I picked this, it, all I could see was requisition approver. I couldn't see cannot update accounts later. So I shortened it and it was, I was able to see that. So under that role, it's the same role, except for without that update permission for the account number. Um, I set up a workflow admin user. This role gives you the permission to set up and manage groups and group chains. So this might be the treasurer or maybe the assistant treasurer, for example. And if I open that up, you can see that it has the permission for groups that gives them the ability to maintain groups. <coughs> and then the workflow admin, which that allows the user with this role to view all in progress requisitions, the requisitioner and the due date. And that also gives you this menu option to see that, the requisitioner, the due date, and the description. <clears throat> I also set up one more role. <clears throat> the workflow bypass role. I have a question in the chat. And the question is the USAS manager does not automatically give access to create or manage groups or chains, correct? Or cor correct was the question. And that is true. You have to add that, um, the permission to add the groups to maintain those.
So for instance, the treasure in this instance is Fran. I have the USAS manager, the workflow bypass, which I'm gonna talk about just in a moment, and then the workflow admin. <clears throat> and if you recall, that workflow admin has that group ability, has that group permission. And then the workflow bypass, this can bypass that workflow chain. So this can be handy, for example, when the lead teacher, Christy, um, submitted her requisition for a field trip for tomorrow, but not everybody has approved the requisition in the chain. And the chain was the secretary to the lead teacher to either or principal to the treasurer. However, the either or principal or assistant, one has COVID, one's in Hawaii, they're not gonna have it by tomorrow. So this role could be assigned to somebody like the treasurer to bypass and give instant access to approval, which expedites the approval chain, skipping everybody else, like the principal who's out sick and the other principal or assistant who's in Hawaii. And it goes to instant approval um, so that the accounts payable uh, person could convert it to a purchase order and the treasurer's office can save the day. So that permission includes just the workflow bypass. And you can customize these as you wish, but those are the certain permissions that are needed. Um, I will submit a requisition here in a moment. I am going to go to the requisition grid to talk and using the more button, I'm gonna pull in this workflow approval status to my grid. and resort it over here. So this, um, these are the st statuses. There are five workflow approval statuses. One of them being pending. Pending means that the requisition has not been submitted for approval yet. It has just been entered. However, in progress, this one has been submitted and is somewhere in the flow in define that it's, it's, it's been submitted and it's somewhere in the uh, approval process defined in the group chain. This, however, the science 0002 has been approved and now um, can be converted. I, the other one is rejected. And if, um, when a requisition is rejected by the approver, the whole approval process is stopped. That rejection email is submitted to the original requisitioner, like Doug, the secretary, and it'll have the notice of rejection with the reason, either predefined reasons or a text, and I'll show you, we'll reject a requisition here in a moment, and I'll show you those predefined buttons or the ability for a text. And then the last status is canceled. And this indicates that, um, the original creator of the requisition recalled the requisition. So Doug recalled this to either delete it because he didn't need it because the other secretary entered the same requisition 
or he could even still modify it, update the account, save it, and then resubmit it. So if, if I recall my requisition for modification, I can, re, I can resubmit it through the group chain. And then it'll be um, shown under here on the approved audit trail. So if you pull this column in on your grid, you can see the workflow approval status here on each rec. You can also um, see it, I'll make this darker, in the middle of the rec. And you can also on the rec, up here on the approval audit trail. This one, I must have picked, I did. It's still impending, so it doesn't have an audit trail yet. That was the one I was gonna submit. So we're at that point of Doug entered, well, admin used, did, but we're gonna pretend that was Doug entered this rec. To submit it, all they would have to do is check mark it here. Wait, I wanted to show you one more thing. On this requisition, there is an attachment. And I just wanted, it's, it doesn't make sense because this is from dues and I just put a custom billing invoice attached. But I was trying to show you that attachments work in this process as well. So, I can either check mark it here, submit, or like I just did, I viewed it and there's a button up here. So in either way, it's gonna open up where you select the group chain. So this is superintendent dues. So I'm just Doug, I'm pretending I'm Doug, gonna just submit it right through the, to the treasurer. Now this workflow changed to in progress. This records that it's been submitted and it defines which group chain it was, to, it was submitted to. And then it shows here too. And I'm actually gonna log in as the treasurer now to show you what like a user would see instead of just the admin. Oops. So Fran is the treasurer. And immediately when this comes up, this is the home page, and you can see your due requisitions that are past due for approval and your yellow tasks that are coming due in a few days, as well as even that one that was dated at the last day of the posting period. So these are all waiting for approval. You can view it from here. And the treasurer has that access to change the account. and approve or reject. So we're gonna approve this one. It comes off this grid. It now will reflect approved on the rec grid so that the accounts payable person can convert it to a requisition. Besides this home screen, the, the user can also go under the workflow menu option requisition approval and see the same thing. They can select all, select all and then hit that or one by one or open them like we did with the view. I am going to open this one. Um, 
And I'm going to reject this because the treasurer's office, which is this code, isn't going to buy these supplies because the maintenance department should. So, and I'm just making up a scenario. I'm going to reject it. I have these predetermined buttons that I can use, which populates down here. Actually, I'm going to use that. And I can also just put text without clicking those buttons. And put my own reason. So I'm going to um, that. And then I'm going to add the treasurer's budget is not covering these expenses. Please use maintenance budget. So that is what's going to go on the email to the original submitter. They're going to get an email. Like Doug is going to get that email with the notice of rejecting, notice of rejection with that reason that I just submitted. And then he can update the requisition and resubmit it through the chain. If it was submitted through the wrong chain, and rejected for that reason, Doug can update that and resubmit it to the correct chain. Um, remember, we gave Fran the treasurer that bypass role. So they have an extra menu option here. And you see there's more requisitions that are in the process than what is really ready for approval for just the treasure. So there's less here than what's out in the system waiting for other people in the chain to approve. <clears throat> so again, like that field trip um, scenario, the field trip is tomorrow and Doug entered the Requisition, I'm trying to find my requisition number. You can see it's in the process. If, if in fact, if the, like Christy calls the treasurer's department and the treasurer's department wants to know where the status is, they can go to the requisition And up here on the tab, they'll be able to see where it was, what chain it was submitted to. And then if you wanted to, you could, you know, continue to figure out who, however, since the treasurer has that role, they can go to that bypass option, pull up that requisition and approve. And now they can go on the field trip. When I do go back to that requisition, here it's gonna show you that Doug originally submitted it on 9-11. The science teacher, Christy, approved it on 9-11. But then for some reason, Betty Jo, the assistant treasurer, was in the chain before and it got changed. She had, she had the bypass um, permission. Doug recalled the requisition to submit it to the right group. Christy approved it. The next step would have been the principal or the assistant, but Fran, the treasurer, bypassed the approval and it's recorded. Pat, you have a question out in the chat. <clears throat> oh, I think Amanda might have answered it. Yeah, she did. But you might want to tell everybody. Yeah. Um, so the question was, how does it know when um, it's rejected? How does it know? what email it goes back to. 
So under the user setup, whatever you have defined here, and it's probably the wrong email, um, right here is where it will go. Or the font, you can see the emails here on the grid. All right, so, oh, recall. So, I'm on the, I'll go to the requisition grid. I am going to sort this by user. I'm pretending I'm Fran. We have a question in the chat, a load feature for user card for emails. I don't know that answer, but um, we will find out that answer and let you know. So these are the requisitions that Fran has entered. You can see that two of them are approved. One of them has been converted. I can't recall um, a converted purchase order. It won't let me. However, even if this one's approved, but not converted, I can recall that requisition. So, and all I would have to do is view it. And that recall button is here. So, if I recall it, the original requisitioner can update the account, can update the vendor, whatever is needed. And then it can be either deleted if it needed to be, or resubmitted. But when it is recalled, again, the status changed to canceled. And all they would have to do is submit for approval after correcting it. So anywhere in the process, as long as it's not been converted, can be recalled. So I recalled approved one. I can recall this one as well by going to view and hitting that recall button. And again, the examples of emails were on the PowerPoint, but at this point, the final um, emails would have been sent. Reading the chat and the answer that my team um, submitted, Amanda said the mass load is currently not available for the user's grid for the email load, but in su the suggestion was to put in a feedback issue to get one created, which Heidi Dutt will do. So we're at that point of, we have some approved um, requisitions. We can go to the requisition grid and now I'm pretending I'm like the accounts payable person. I can sort for approved requisitions, converted false. I can select one. And again, I can select all and submit, convert. Because these requisitions, requisitions are all approved. Or I added this in the PowerPoint with much more detail, but uh, you can also, if the district wants a report showing all the approved recs um, to be converted, be, you know, get a report before they convert, they can take the SSDT requisition detail report and modify it. And I did that here. by just pulling in the workflow approval status. I did sum the amount. So the report gave a total of 
approved recs that I was going to approve. And then I configured that to work flow approval status to equal approved, converted. I think that one's already were in there. And then when I generated it, it would give me the report of all approved requisitions. Pat, <clears throat> there's a question. That, uh, do emails go out to approvers when a rec is recalled? <clears throat> yes. So when we go back, let me log into admin. I think it's it's if it's like if the um, submitter recalls it, then they're asking if it would send an email to the approver. And so I don't think that we have that. Um, I glanced over these. You're right. But I'm thinking that would be a good yeah. I think that would be a good feedback issue though, if that's something that you think the users are going to want. Are there any other questions? Pat, can you hear me? This is Andrew. Yes, I can hear you. My specific concern, I figured it would be easier to talk than um, throw it in the chat, um, is let's say somebody recalls the rack and it's a big approval chain potentially, and then they send it back through. I could see a principal then just rejecting it afterwards because they say, I've already approved this. You know, that that kind of a thing like if they don't if the people in the flow don't know when things get recalled i can see them canceling thinking it's a duplicate that that was my thought behind that that makes sense um i'm looking to see which one i recalled i recalled let's see Oops, the recall status is canceled. You know, I'm wondering if, um, I don't think when they're approving, I don't think they can see that audit trail, right, Pat? Like that's only for the person who, that's only when you're looking at the requisition. Right, I was trying to find an example. Um, yeah, it would be like Doug, the secretary that would recall his own. I can see your point about, and but I honestly would have to test that scenario. So I think that I think that that's a really good um, point with that scenario. And so I think if you put in a ticket that we can make a feedback issue, that kind of stuff really helps when we're talking to the development team to be able to provide like, hey, here's why something like this might be important. And I also think, though, that like we'll probably want to review this because like for maybe like an optional, um, which I know we do have a feedback issue to like you know, if they want certain um, emails like on or off, because the other thing that I can see is you know, the first person in an approval, if they have somebody that's like submitting, oh, I've, I messed something up, I'm gonna recall. Oh, I'm gonna submit, okay, I'm gonna recall. Like they could email bomb somebody with that. So I think that's probably the thought process behind like not having that. Um, but that's why, but I feel like if we added it, it would be something that we wanna make optional. I could probably test one really quick here. I just clone that. Oops, wrong one. So Doug is going to submit this. 
We'll do high school science. So it's going to go to Christy, the sub science teacher. She's the next approver. Oops. And it shows up here. And it was this one. Oh, but I don't know if I have the email set up. So yeah, yeah. go ahead and put a feedback issue in and we'll um, take that to the development team. We do also have biweekly meetings um, like we do for USAS and USPS with the development team. So, um, you know, this is excellent to um, have feedback like this on the training because this is something that we can actually discuss with them, um, you know, once you get a feedback issue and kind of talk about what options might help with that scenario. Any other questions on the requisition approval? Yeah, somebody asked if you could circle back to that rec report when you get a chance. Uh, they're asking, can that be a SSET template one instead of just district creating one? Or maybe I missed a step on that. Um, <clears throat> in the PowerPoint, I did kind of show you, but I did take this template report and all I did was go under select properties, pull this over, added the sum, and then I showed you what I did. Um, it's easy to customize, but I can, if you want to put in a ticket, I can send you that report definition for sure. Sorry to keep popping in here, but I think the other thing too, like um, I know that there's been some questions about like the report definition. I know we've gotten questions on like creating the roles as well. And so, you know, definitely all of those things with this being so new, like we're happy to take the feedback. Um, yeah, Sharon mentioned, maybe we could put it in the shared reports. Some of these things too, like, I, I think it's kind of like keeping in mind that, you know, the requisition approvals, if, like it's not something that everybody's going to use, right? So we didn't like just preemptively put, you know, the definitions and the roles and stuff like that in there just because it's like it would show for everybody. So it's kind of a hard line for SSDD to figure out if you want to, you know, kind of put these things in there. Um, so at least to start, we didn't. But that's where I think the feedback issues come in. But um, yeah, we'll we'll take a look at um, adding that to the shared reports library for sure. And if there's any other ones, please send in the feedback or questions. And if you guys want a five, 10 minute break, Lori is up next with employee onboarding. I'll stop sharing and pause the recording. <clears throat> okay, you're on. All righty. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to be going over the employee onboarding portion of the workflows for USPS. Um, the first thing I'll talk about is we do, just like Pat had said, we have that documentation out there as, the, as far as the technical setup of the, of the workflows. And, <coughs> excuse me, I'll just uh, show you real quick just in case we had some latecomers and they missed that at the beginning. Oops, hold on here, I'm hitting something. That's out in the wiki. And it's basically, um, when Mark sent out the message last Friday, I believe it was, about the workflows, he included the link as well. But we do have a workflows installation guide and it explains all the information as far as the technical side of things, how to get things set up or the workflows. Um, then when you are in the USPS redesign screen, in order to, to turn the workflows on, you have to go to the modules uh, screen 
and there's an actual workflows module that has to be turned on in order for you to be able to see that workflows module at the top of the screen as well as a tab. So down here is the workflows module. I'll go ahead and turn this on. And then I'll refresh my screen. When I refresh, you should then see a new tab at the top by the use as integration tab. Maybe, there it is, the workflows tab. Um, one other thing that we need to do is we need to go into the configuration screen under system and we need to turn on the employee onboarding option. So down here we have the workflows configuration, but we need to make sure that we check the employee onboarding option in order for this to be turned on. So I'll go ahead and check that box and then I'll click the save option. And so now my employee onboarding is all set up as far as within the USPS system, as far as being able to utilize that. Um, <clears throat> as far as roles that need to be applied for the onboarding, um, any employee that has the USPS standard access will have access to the workflows. Um, if other employees maybe need access, maybe they don't have USPS standard access, um, the USPS standard employee role will give them access to the employee onboarding option. Um, if an employee has USPS standard employee view only, that allows them to view workflows, but it does not show them the, uh, the start onboarding process option where they can actually start uh, using the onboarding system. Um, anyone that has USPS standard employee create or employee view role um, is, is going to be allowed to view, create, and also delete any new employee onboarding that is, that is out there. And one other thing to keep in mind is um, other users can edit other users. So let's just say that I went out and started an onboarding and <clears throat> I had a few of the, of the uh, screens created. Well, maybe I'm out on sick leave. Um, another user has the capability of going in and at, you know, continuing the process of onboarding so they can get that employee created. The only thing that another, another user cannot do is delete a an onboarding record that another user had created. They cannot delete it. So keep that in mind. So we'll go ahead and, and start talking about using the employee onboarding option. So um, what we're going to do is go to the workflows tab and then click on the employee onboarding option. And when you do that, um, one thing to keep in mind, if the district has it set up where they automatically assign IDs. There's an option on here when we go in to start the onboarding process that they can actually say that they want to assign the employee number. And that is because they already have the module and the, and the configuration already set up to assign employee IDs. So if I went in and click on the assign employee number, and then I just go in and put in the employee name, so let's just do, we're going to do Mickey Mouse. And then I'm going to go ahead and click the accept option. Once I do that, you'll see that it assigned the ID for the employee. Again, that's because this district has it set up to, to assign employee IDs. Now, here's my employee, Mickey Mouse. If I go into the View tab, I'm going to now see the employee onboarding options over here on the left. So the first option is to create an employee. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the bubble. And then I have to go in It's ask me if I want to start the task. I'm going to say start. I want to start the task. So here you'll see there are certain fields that are required. And those are designated by with the red asterisk. Now you can see that like the employee number already pulled in because I, I, that was created when I started my onboarding. 
I do have to add the social security number. Person last name, again, are already pulled in from the initial onboarding uh, starting. And then I could go in, you know, and, and enter all the information I want to as far as their address. And then once I've got all of my information entered in that I that I want to have entered in on the employee record, I click the save option. And then I need to click uh, click on the complete task. Once I do that, you'll see there's a check mark next to the create employee option and then the create position option option or is then highlighted so then i can i can click on the bubble to create the position maybe it's kind of going slow again i get a box asking me to confirm do i want to start the task of creating a position yes i do so i'm going to click the start option Laura, you have a question. If a district does not have an automatic oh. ID checked and they check the assign ID in the onboarding, do they get an error? Um, that's a good question. I do not know. Hold on. We'll go back and we will just test it real quick and see. I'm assuming they should get an error or no ID will be assigned. But let me just go in and try doing it. We'll see. Well, I can. This never mind. Well, let me turn off the. Uh, let me turn off the. Come on. Um, let's see. Uh, configuration or module. I can't remember. Let me go down here. What are you numbering? We'll test it out real quick. We're gonna just turn it off for a minute. And then I'm going to go ahead and try it and see what it does. All right. Yeah, actually, it happens right at the beginning. It won't even allow me to do it because it says the employee number automatic assigned is not configured. So yeah, you can't even begin because it's that's not that configuration is not set up. I wasn't sure exactly when it would do it or how it would do it, but you do get an error. So let me just go back here and turn that back on. Okay. All right. So um, let me go back to my workflows. And I'll go back to Mickey Mouse. What is this? All right, so the next thing I'm doing, I want to create the position. I'm going to go ahead and start the task. And then on the position, and I didn't mention this on employee, but if the district has templates set up for, you know, employer position, uh, payroll items, um, they can actually use the templates that they have. So if I went in, let's just say that the sister it does have a, a template if i choose that template it will automatically you know just like um when you're creating a new employee without using the onboarding um it will actually put in all the template information on the screen and then i could just go in and uh populate the information that i want and you, again there are certain fields that are required pay group is one of them position number is one of them but uh, since I used a template, I had a position number one already assigned, so I put that in there. But I do need to choose a pay group because that is a required um, field. And the job status, again, populated from the template. Uh, I can put in my start and stop dates. Um, I could choose my supervisor. If they're eligible for leave, I'm going to mark that. All of the EMIS related information, I'm just going to go ahead and skip all that for now. Um, I put the wrong format up for the date. I'm going to go ahead and save this. And then after I save it, I need to click on complete the task because completing the task will actually then move me to my next screen that I'm going to be creating which is going to be the compensation record. So 
So if I click on that, and you can tell, you can see it's pretty, it's pretty repetitive. Like you're clicking start the task. I want to start the task. And then I'm going to go ahead and I want to create my compensation. Again, require field um, has, has to be defined. Compensation type has to be defined. The pay plan has to be defined. The pay unit, again, has to be defined. If I want to choose a job calendar, I could put a description, the hours in the day. Now, right now, and I think we have an issue for this, when I create this uh, compensation, um, it will not populate the uh, paper period or the unit amount, so I have to manually enter it in. And I know that's a real, it's kind of a hassle. But we do have something out there you know, maybe to add like a calculate option. Goodness, got something crazy in my hours per day. Um, no status supplemental taxing option. Oops, got a severe error on that. What that's from. Oh, okay. Um, pays in the contract, let's do 26. And number of work days. Actually, that should populate from the calendar. And this, um, this is a stretch pay job. We'll go ahead and mark that. And I'll go ahead and save this. And I'm going to complete the task because I want to go to my payroll accounts. So the next thing I'm creating. By clicking confirm, I want to start this process. I'm going to go ahead and add the accounts. And do adding your pay accounts is just like um, if you were adding the employee, you know, through the dashboard. Um, you're going to go in and make sure you select your account that you want to charge to. Um, if you have more than one, you know, maybe you're setting up a fixed account for $100, and then you want to create another account for the percentage of 100, you can do that. Uh, let's see. Um, There's another I'm question not. in the chat. Do that one. OK, yeah, uh, let me take a look here. Um, you know when that will be addressed, the auto calculate for unit and purpose. Um, Heidi, I do not know. Uh, I will look and find out if we have a deer issue out there for that. And if not, uh, we will definitely talk about that at our next workflow meetings. And like um, Amanda had said, we have meetings like every other week for that. So yes, definitely we'll, because that's huge. I know that was one thing I noticed right away. I'm like, that's a real hassle. <laughs> you want to be able to want that to calculate it automatically. So we will definitely get that going as soon as we can. Um, so I've got my pay accounts created. I'm gonna save them. And then I just complete the task after those are saved. And that should move me down to the payroll items. Now, for the payroll items, one thing um, we need to go over, and this is like uh, kind of like a one and done, one-time setup thing. Um, you can, the, the district can go in and put in uh, payroll items that are required, which would probably be like your federal, your Medicare, um, maybe your state of Ohio. And then you can put in items that may be required, like your retirement. Um, maybe you have uh, medical insurance, dental insurance. What the district needs to do is before they actually can go in, to an employee's record, they have to make sure that they have, they go to a payroll item configuration and they need to have it set up before they start creating the employee. Because if they don't, let's just say that um, they don't have anything marked on the, on the payroll item configuration record as far as payroll items. Well, if they don't have them set up as required or maybe, maybe required, they aren't going to show up on the payroll item configuration or the payroll item screen for the employee 
um, because when you have them required or maybe required, they already show up on the screen. Well, if you don't have that set up already, it's not going to show up. And even if you start an employee, go into payroll item configuration and create it, I don't believe it's still going to put that on the screen. So you want to make sure that the district, that's one of the things that the district does probably initially is gets, gets that set up under payroll item configuration. And what I'm talking about is, I'm like, here's your federal record. <clears throat> when you go into that federal record, you have a required box and you have a show on uh, create wizard box. Make sure that both of those are checked if you want that to appear as required on the payroll item, because when it shows as required, what's going to happen is when we go to the payroll item screen, it'll show federal tax and that cannot be deleted. Anything that is maybe required can be deleted off of the screen. So this one here cannot be deleted, but maybe we have the STRS. Let me just go to the 590 real quick. If I can find it, there it is. If I go to that, anything that may be required should just have the show on create wizard box checked, not the required box, just the show on create wizard box check. So then when we go back, the workflows when we go to the employee onboarding and we go to payroll items for Mickey Mouse here. We're going to go to payroll items. When we go to payroll items, any of the payroll items that I have marked as required or maybe required are now going to appear on this box. Now, the thing that the district's going to have to remember is because I went out and I have anything SERS or STRS required. Well, more than likely, this person is only going to be paying into one retirement entity. So what I have to do is I have to go in and delete the entity that I do not want appearing. Because what's going to happen if I don't delete it is when I go in and start creating my payroll items for the employee, any, anything that I, so if I didn't go in and add anything for this STRS item, if I go to save this, I'm going to get an error. It's going to say, hey, you know, you have an item sitting out here that may need to, may be required to be added. So in order for that error not to happen, I have to go in and get rid of just X, just click the X and get rid of anything that I do not need to add data to for the payroll item. Now, districts don't have to put in those maybe required. They could just go in manually and do an add payroll item if they wanted to. It's up to the district. Um, let me go here because obviously I don't have employer pickup for this employee for SERS. So then all that I should be seeing are my federal, my state, and Medicare. And you'll notice that the X is grayed out. I cannot X that out because it's a required payroll item. And then my may be required are all, they have the uh, X not grayed out. So I can actually go in and get rid of those if this employee doesn't pay city taxes. Maybe they don't pay into a school district. I can go in and get rid of those. So now I have all the, the payroll items that I need for this employee. Plus, if I wanted to add, you know, maybe uh, medical insurance, dental insurance, uh, some other, um, you know, um, payroll item that they want, that they need to have set up for them, I can do that. So I'm going to go ahead and start working on setting up the payroll items for the employee. So the first one is the SCRS annuity record. And you'll notice we have the choose template option. So if the district has the template set up for their SERS employee portion, the 590, it actually pulls it in with the 10%. I could go in and just save that record. All right, then I've got my next one, which is the state taxes. Again, if I wanted to, I could manually enter in, in the information. If I have a template set up, I can actually use that template 
Um, is there a way the onboarding can be intuitive, like classic brown screen to only display the retirement codes that were associated with the position code, a position record? Um, I don't think, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I know what you're saying, but um, we may have to put that in as a feedback issue as far as like only using the retirement option that they're marked as on the position record. Um, Mary, go ahead and create a ticket for that. And then maybe we'll, we could create a feedback issue for that if we don't already have one. I don't think we do, but go ahead and create a feedback or create a ticket and we'll get a feedback issue created for that. And then another question is you have to delete the maybe require pay rider if they don't apply or can you leave them untouched? Um, you do have to delete them because if you don't, um, what's going to happen is when you go to set to save the payroll items, you'll get an error message saying that one of the one of the items showing on the payroll items has not been created. So you would have to delete that out in order for that error message not to occur. Um, Okay, so here's my state record. Uh, maybe all I have to enter in are the exemptions. Go ahead and do that. The tax tables used, rate zero because it's already defaulted. I'll save that record. Um, the next one is your SDR, your board paid SDRS. And the 14% should already, oh, I guess it would be there if I use the template, and it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and, again, I could just save that because I use the template, it's already set up. Um, actually, Lori, Lori Nye, you're the one that asked about this. I, I forgot to delete this 450. So when we go in to save, I'll leave it. And then that way, I'm not going to do anything with it because this employee is SCRS. I'll just leave this and we should see an error message then when I go to save. So I'm going to go to the federal tax record. I'll use the template. And uh, because I don't have filing status on the template, I have to make sure I, I mark the filing status. If I didn't, I would get an error. And then Medicare, which is also a required payroll item. It's already set up. If I use the template, the rate 1.45% and the employer rate 1.45%. Go ahead and save that. So now I've got all of my payroll items. I'm not gonna go in, I could go in and add if I wanted to. Uh, let's just try like a 500. Uh, let's do this annuity. I'll just do this amount. Oops. Let and we'll get hundred dollars. Oops. And I'll go ahead and save it. <clears throat> Oops, I forgot the rate type. It told me it didn't like that. Let me get out of that and go ahead and put a rate type in there. I thought I did, but evidently not. All right. So now I've got all of my payroll items created. If I go click save. Oh, you know what? It did save it. Maybe, maybe. Oh, hold on. My dog decided she wants to play with her toy right now. Okay. There we go. Um we may have made a change so it doesn't do that anymore. I'm going to have to check into that because last I knew if you had something out there, it would not create the record unless you created the, the payroll item. So it looks like maybe it saved it, but let's try doing complete the task. There it is. I knew somewhere there's an, an error message. Must have a rate type, must have a pay cycle. And I believe if I go in and get rid of this STRS record, click save, complete the task, yeah. So 
yeah, that's I was I knew that I saw an error message when that happened. So you have to make sure, you know, if there's an item that you don't want pulled in, you'd have to just get rid of it, delete it. Um, let's see, we have a quick other question. Could there be a feature added where we could select multiple payroll items to delete instead of doing them one at a time? Um, that's a very good question, Larry. And again, there's a JIRA issue for that. Perfect, okay. Looks like we have a JIRA issue for that question already. Yeah, Andrew, Andrew found the JIRA issue. So we do already have that uh, 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 JIRA issue out there for that. Thank you for that question. Okay, um, so I went in and completed my task for creating the payroll items. My next uh, item is going to be to create the leaves. Because this employee is eligible for leave, I can go in and create the leaves. I'm gonna go ahead and start this task. Maybe, my system being a little slow here all of a sudden, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and go into the personal leave first, and I'm gonna give him a give uh, him a balance because he's just starting. And then we'll do the max, oh, I've got the max. What am I doing? The reason, that's what I want. And then the, is it daily or hourly? I'm gonna save that. Then I'm gonna to go to the sick leave. Uh, maybe he carried over a balance of, you know, 10 days or something from his old job. And then I need to put in his acute per month, the mass leave, and then the daily or hourly, save that. And then I'll do the vacation. I'll do the acute for the vacation, the max for the vacation, and then the daily or hourly. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and save that. When I save that on the leave screen, then I, when we when I complete this, we're gonna go look at the leave screen, but his balances that I added should be included out there. We'll go ahead now and, and we'll do the last option, which is create the pay distributions. And I'm just going to go down to the add distribution option. I'm just going to do a direct deposit. We'll just do 100%. And the direct deposit type is already defined. If it's going to a different type, I would go ahead and change it. Uh, the routing number, I need to make sure I have that set correctly. And then the ACH source, you'll notice it already defaults to the payroll ACH transfer 001 option. If your district has a different one or has more than one, they may have to go in and select the correct one. I'm gonna go ahead and save that. Oops. What happened here? Come on. Hmm. Let me just try it without the dash. Huh, that was strange. Okay. All right, so now I've created my payroll distribution. And like I said, after you create every one, you need to make sure you save it, and then you need to complete your task. I wonder if I did not do that. I don't think I did that with my leaves. I don't think I did because you can see that it's unchecked. Let me go into this. Those are all there. They're all set. Okay. Let me just go in, come on, save it, and then I'll complete the task. Okay. So now we've, we've created all of our screens for the new employee. We can now go in and review all of the screens and we'll get tabs across the top with all of the screens listed as far as like employee position compensation pay accounts, everything that we just went in and created. You'll see all of the tabs here. So I could go in at this point and review my employee uh, screen, the position screen, the compensation screen. If I needed to make a change at all, I could go in and do that. 
and then we save have a it. Couple of chat messages. Alrighty. Um. Whoops. I forgot to scroll down here. Um. After you complete a task, can you go back and edit? No, you cannot. The only way you can edit is once you get to review. Then you can go in and edit any screen that you want to at that point. And like I just did, I went in and added this description and I just click, I clicked on save because if you can do the complete task, then you're finishing the onboarding. So we don't want a complete task when we're doing the review. Because like if I go back to position, that, that description should say test because I clicked save. So no, you cannot go back once you've created the uh, the screen on the onboarding, but uh, anything can be updated at when you're doing the review. Um, well, let's skip over leaves if they are not eligible. Yes. Um, actually, Larry, if the leaves, um, if they're not eligible for leaves, that should be just grayed out and it should uh, it, I'm not even sure if it'll even put it on. It may put it on there. You may see it on there, but you will not be able to select it because they are not eligible for leaves. Um, I think there may be a Jira issue for that as well. I know this was brought up at a WESA demo session. Can you mass load to the workflows? As of right now, no, you cannot mass load. Um, I'm sure that we'll be working on something for that. Um, Marsha, you may want to create a ticket for that, and we can add a uh, JIRA issue for that. Okay. Um, so now let's just say I've gone through all of my screens, reviewed everything, you know, everything looks good. Maybe I had to add something here or there, did all of that. Payroll accounts. Maybe I needed, let me add another payroll account. And again, this is where I'm actually going in. If you know I, something was incorrect when I added it initially, I could go in and correct it or add something else. All right, so then I'm going to save that. Is that amount to not equal 100? Oh, I must not have. Oh, that's because I forgot to change this effects. And you'll notice, which is nice, it gives you errors just like it does if you were doing that um, on the browse screen or in the, on, the, on the employee screen or the, in this instance, payroll account screen. So once I've gone in and I've reviewed all of the screens, I could then go in and click on the complete task option. Once I've done that, that employee is now going to appear in the dashboard and that employee can be paid. So if I go in here, I should be able to see Mickey Mouse. Maybe, there, there he is. And so Mickey Mouse is now ready to be paid. So if I went in here, I think I have a payroll already started. I could go into current, I can just add him to this. Yeah, I do have a payroll. So let's go into current. We'll add Mickey Mouse. All right, so there's Mickey Mouse. I'm going to pay Mickey Mouse for the, on this payroll. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you really quickly because I talked about leaves is we should be able to go to his leave screen and we should see that those two balances, the sick balance that I added as well as the uh, personal balance. So here's the 10 days that I added and the three days I added for his personal. 
And again, this is still, there's a lot of things that they're working on, you know, maybe to improve it, to add things, uh, ex example, like the mass loading. Um, let me take a look here. Does the system run in error if the payroll accounts don't equal 100%? Actually, I think we just saw that when um, I had two, I had two accounts set up for a percentage of hundred. So yes, it did provide an error for that. Um, let's see. All thing, all things flagged with employee onboarding right now. I'm not sure. Andrew put a gear issue that we have out there. Let me just pull that issue up and see exactly what. We're talking about here. Maybe. Again, does anyone else, anybody have any other questions while I'm trying to get that other issue to pull up? Um, up here it is. Some validations should also be run on save. Okay. Um, I try to link all things with the label employee onboarding. I tried to link to all things with the label employee onboarding. Hey, Lori. I just was, yeah. I tried to just put the link in that would take people to the list of all the open Jira issues with your label for that. Gotcha. Thank you. So Thank I, you. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yep. And I, I just got yeah, it just since pulled we up. baited, me, I had it. Let me slide it over here. There we go, Andrew. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, here are all of the um, employee onboarding issues that are out there right now. So it doesn't look like there's a lot, but um, anything that we talked about, if it's not already out there, go ahead and create a ticket and we'll get that added as well. Thank you so much, Andrew, for putting that out there. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? All right, um, everyone have a great weekend and thank you for tuning in and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Thanks guys, both of these things look awesome. Yes, exciting, so exciting. Thanks. Thank you.